Hey, uh, how you doing? Oh, I see you have a Skype camera. You won't need it because this is strictly audio, but if you want to keep it on, that's up to you. My cool. recording is going and all that. It says recording a call. Uh, it's good to know. So, um, I guess to start off, we'll uh, allow you to introduce yourself. You got the floor to answer the question of who is Greg Mara and what does he do? I only know about you from that video that I saw Greg Prescott upload um, on the uh, Sarasota beach where you uh, had uh, allegedly have some magical powers and were able to do some things that you did uh, for people. So I guess tell us uh, who you are, what kind of things you were doing and what other things you do. And while you're doing that, I'll try to get your uh, Facebook page and your um, sculpting website up so I can maybe use them as a guide throughout this interview. So who's Greg Mara? What does he do? You got the floor. All right. Um, well, I, someone asked me a long time ago, said, who are you? Like, who, who are you really? And it, and it struck me, um, you know, that's a question that we all kind of try to answer. And it started, you know, I'm a man who, who, who wants to be loved and who wants to love the world. And as a sculptor, um, you know, I got a master's degree in New York City, traveled through Europe and came back to the United States and noticed that there was a lack of, um, you know, uh, memorials to her heroism that needed to be to, needed to be resolved. And so for the past four years, I was sculpting and sculpting heroes. And I sculpted uh, Chris Kyle, the American sniper, and it was um, I gave it to his family, the statue for free. And um, it, it's funny, his spirit has always followed me because his mission was to help soldiers with PTSD. And um you know, I believe that soldiers come back from Iraq and Afghanistan and they commit suicide at 22 a day, you know, 22 soldiers a day because they're affected by demons and spirits from these foreign lands and things that, that they had to go through and see. And then um, what happened uh, not too long ago is I kind of be- eased off on the sculpture world and and uh, launched spiritsculptor.com, maraspiritsculptor.com, which is... Um, healing and cleansing uh, people all over the world. Um, and what I, what I basically have is authority over negative spirits and demons. Um, I remove negative demons, spirits, disembodied spirits uh, from people. Then I look at uh, alien attacks. I remove those alien attacks, uh, remove um, the karmic trauma that they have, implants, clear their homes, clear their animals, scan their bodies for physical problems, ask the angels to heal them, see dead people, psychic read, um, pretty much the whole gamut. But the the strength in my work is that it's not me doing it. I'm just a human that's, um, you know, here and I'm fallible just like everybody else. It's the spirit that's doing it. And um, the primary uh force that I use are angels and the angels I can tell you I can uh, locate where they're standing trace out their bodies in sand or on the ground and I can tell you that they're massive they're like you know anywhere from 10 to 15 and sometimes more uh, feet tall and uh, I've had uh, out of I think it was in the past three months I've cleared uh, 350 people uh, around 150 homes, four farms, uh, 15 horses, seven children. And it's been, uh, com- it's been completely successful. So that's pretty much it for now. Cool. Um, interestingly, I, I don't think your, um, that video that Greg Prescott uploaded, um, with you is actually on his channel anymore. I'm looking at the, um, videos here and I don't see it. I don't know if he took it down for, or if it was uh, taken down. I mean, I had a little problem with his uh, page yesterday when his recent um, video uploaded 22 hours ago in 5D lifting the Cosmic Veil Conference Part 1 uh, was uploaded, but it didn't appear on my list of subscriptions. That's the uh, YouTube censorship Nazis uh, getting the better of everybody. So, uh, uh, Greg, you're leaving your computer. Is everything okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I'm good. I just uh, had Okay. Yeah. No problem. So, um, yeah, I got your uh, website here. You said that white was that site was Mara Spirit Sculptor. 
dot com. All yes. right, I'll see if I can maybe use that throughout the uh, of course this interview as a little bit of a guide. But um, which um, were you at uh, the recent in five D conference that Cos- lifting Cosmic Veil one in Seattle? It killed me not being there. But, uh, were you there? <laughs> No, I was, and I've been just, I've been just staying here clearing people, yeah. and um, you know, I did, I have like you know, ten to twelve clients a day, and I just keep firing away, making sure that as many people as possible are freed, you know. Cool. Uh, now you say you use the um, the angels. Now, which angels are you talking about here? Are you? Talking about like the archangels, uh, Michael, Gabriel, Uriel, and uh, Raphael, those guys, or are you talking about the um, uh, lower angels who are, in a sense, kind of like subordinate to the uh, archangels? Or do you, do you use a combination of both? The uh, I can tell you from the downloads I have that that the the higher archangels, you know, like Michael, they are the generals. There's also another like regiment of archangels that are below them and then there's like the infantry so to speak you know and i use all of them after i clear after i clear each person i assign two angels to stand behind them and protect them and then also after i clear homes i send four archangels to stand on each corner of each home and um you know the download i've been that I received is it takes three human spirits to create an angel. You know, that, that an angel is actually a combination of three spirits that have fulfilled their mission on earth. Um, so to speak there. And, um, they, uh, it's interesting. I've actually seen where angels have a lifespan as well. I remember one time I sent an angel to take care of a woman who was ill and I actually saw that angel die. It was really amazing. I was so sad, but at the same time, I was I knew that this angel's going somewhere. And then the download that came to me was that when the angels died, that's when the spirit goes back to source. That's the uh, final mission. So to, you know. Okay, so when these these angels die, um, are, is it is death the proper word to use, or are they just um like like when a human being's uh body telescope dies um which could best be described as like the unavoidable result of an oxygen deprived brain that's what like a third dimensional scientist would refer to as death but we in the spirituality community wouldn't really um want to ever think of death as being a real thing because we know we're just consciousness but these um these (laughs) angels when they die it's not an oxygen deprived brain that's causing their their death it's got to be something else so when they die what, what is the cause of it and what where does their uh heart soul essence uh travel to does it just ascend for lack of a better word to a higher dimension if the angel did all it had to do and fulfilled its uh, goals and missions well you you answered it when when you fulfill your goals and missions um you uh you're sent to another realm on a higher plane and death is just transformation i mean i'm actually a two-time suicide survivor and um, I can tell you that when I had that gun to my head that time, which was scarier than all scary moments, um, there was a feeling of peace. Um, it, it was very strangely pleasant, and I don't recommend it. But the reason why I went through that is because now I know I can relate to people that do think that way or do go that way. And um, it's, you know, death is is not to be feared. It's we, we shouldn't fear death. We just fear the, the transition. We fear how it's going to happen. And um, it's uh, I know that when angels fulfill their mission and they're not in that body form anymore, they go back to source. Um, the download I got was that our reincar- through our reincarnations, our mission is to serve the universe as best as possible, come forth with all the riddles from our our generational flaws, figure out how to fulfill this mission, which is, you know, every morning wake up and how do I assist you? How do I assist you? And once and when we do that, finally, um, we can we can become part of an angel. An angel being. Interesting. Um, so when these um, 
Now, when you're talking about spirit, I, I it, kind of interested to know why you choose to use the word a uh, spirit because, like, what's the difference between soul and spirit? Some cultures and societies say they're just two different words for the same thing, but I've heard other people give a more um, generalized difference description between soul and uh, and spirit. Um, probably the best diff person giving up the best difference I can think of was George Kavaslis, who once described um, soul as the essence, the isness of everything, and consciousness, which is the awareness of being aware, emanates from, is one of two things that emanates from soul. The other thing that emanates is spirit. And he best described it as um, as spirit. Bear with me, because I got a little bit of a comic cold here. But uh, spirit yeah. is, um, he, he describes that as the little bits of the soul that go to specific times and places um, that can, like, acknowledge that space and time are illusions, but the spirit um, gets rid of the illusion, if you know what I mean, so we can go to certain times and places to manifest the, the soul's intentions, and he said you could sort of think of the word spirit as a play on the words a spear and it, like you're throwing a spear at it, a spear at something, and the spirit is like the little spears that um, get thrown out of the um, the soul. So when you use the word spirit, do you use it in a sense that could be used interchangeably with soul, or do you think, yeah, that uh, there is definitely a distinct difference between soul and spirit? Well, I can ask the spirit that I work with to answer that. I never really actually thought about that too much, and I can tell you this, that how I operate is clicking all the above. You know, if someone gives a definition of it, it sounds good. And someone else has a definition. It sounds good because the truth is, I don't know. Nobody really does. The answer is, what do we do? What do we do here on Earth to fulfill our missions? You know, we all have a mission and that's what I focus on. And my my work primarily is based on how how do I take away the dark stuff, the, the, the evil that's hurting people and remove that from them? You know, I have a, I have a three step process. The first personal cleansing is that I come in and I take away all the outside forces attacking you. Right. Um, whether it's your soul or spirit, whatever is being attacked, um, your your let's just use spirit as the term, okay? Your spirit can be attacked. It'll cause you to have depression. So now your mental is being attacked, and now you're depressed, and so you start suffering physically. And so a lot of times we go to uh, you know doctors for our physical problems, and we go to psychologists for our mental problems, and we'll go to a church or a spiritual advisor or meditation class to maintain our spirit but there's people with special gifts to go out and cleanse that for you and um i have that gift and my mission is to help as many people along you know healing marriages i've been healing marriages i healed one yesterday that was just phenomenally uh disrupted by the by this this this, this force of deception and uh, it was it was just amazing in two hours to make two people aware that they need to come together in spirit and embrace that and let all this outside noise and all this deception go away because they they're on a they have a mission on Earth that is very large. I mean it's it's extremely big mission and it can't fail. And there's like I have a couple words that I like spirituality is teamwork to me. That's teamwork. Faith is courage, the courage to call someone up and ask for help. Um, a lot of times we go it alone. I, I, a lot of my, you know, I say clients, I call them my fellow angels, you know, and they like, they say, well, I've been clearing myself. I've been doing everything I need to do. I've been trying to do it. And then I scan them and they're affected by 300 percent negative spirits and demons. And it's like, well, the secret to fulfilling that mission is, is faith and trust. And everybody says, I mean, everybody's I've been hurt so much in my life. I don't trust people. 
Every relationship I get in, I feel like I'm being abused. Every and I and I say to them, you can't be successful without trust. The challenge is that we can isolate as much as we want, but we have to be able to work as a team in order to get through this. And uh, I mean, I could go on forever about what I've learned in the past few months dealing with so many different cases. The one one of the things I find interesting is how the universe sends people like in flocks. They do triage the first two weeks of healing people on a mass global scale or cleansing people is, is um, people were primarily being attacked by aliens. And then the next group, people had removed their own heart implants. And I'm like, well, this is interesting. All these people are coming in certain groups. So something out there in the spirit world is, is sending them in groups like triage. Then I tell my clients some more important, amazing things is like, you know, a primary, the primary basis of most of our generational karmic problems, which is what affects me, my father, my grandfather, and for hundreds of years, is this feeling that we are God. We, we have this um, misunderstanding that we are the source and that we can make these things happen. And the truth is we can't control anyone or anything. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, when you walk from here to the mailbox, can you can, can you tell me what you're going to think on your 10th step? And they're like, no. I said, you know, you might think about gummy bears or you might think about something that happened in high school. You might think, you know. But if you if you look at your feet and you walk to that mailbox and control it, you're, you're missing the birds flying by. You might hit a tree. And the, the primary importance of everything I do is that I and this may come striking and people might like it or not. I'm nothing. I said, what do you mean you're nothing? I'm nobody. I mean, 300 years from now, my tombstone is going to be mowed over and they're probably not going to know where it is. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I visited graveyards where the, the tombstones are from the 1700s. They're dilapidated. They're falling apart. And they're just getting mowed over. I've doused many churches and there's actually parking lots over the cemetery parts. I'm finding graves that are actually where there's a parking lot, you know, and what what that means is I'm nobody because the force is everything. It's the force that's doing everything. And so my the challenge in my life is to how do I lead a successful, amazing life? And that is to ask the force for help. Use the force, Luke. Right. And, uh, you know, using like a Star Wars analogy, like when Luke Skywalker was trying to lift the X-Wing fighter. Right. He's like, ah, oh, he, like he couldn't do it and it fell in the mud. And then Yoda comes along and he's like, I can do this. And, you know, he with his pudgy fingers, he lifts up the X-Wing fighter. And what Luke was saying is the force isn't strong enough to do it. And Yoda said, no, it is. You just need to get out of the way. So, you know. Asking the force to do it. When people call me, they say, I, I need help. All right. So they're, they're practicing courage, which is faith. They're having faith in another person. Courage to surrender control, not trying to be God and letting someone else help them out. Then this miracle happens and all these demons are taken away. Their home is cleansed. Then they go through a karmic cleanse where they realize the certain characteristics they have that hold their family back for hundreds of years. And now they're actually able and armed with what they need in order to live a happy, healthy life. Will it come with challenges? Absolutely. But but the 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 the, the thing that they've been their soul or spirit or one. Is now aware. And prepared. All right. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, I often use that example of um, Luke Skywalker and Yoda with the 
with with the um starship to show um how belief makes all the difference. Uh, well, Luke was like, uh, moving rocks is one thing. This is totally different. And Yoda said, no, it's no different. It's only different in your mind. You got to unlearn what you unlearned. And after he he did himself, Luke was like, I don't believe it. And Yoda said, uh, yeah, that's why you fail because you didn't believe. Yeah, that's what what was said. And I often I do make reference to that on my show often because it <laughs> makes the point to show the power of beliefs. But um. Since you, I hate to bring this up again, but um, you mentioned uh, you were a suicide survivor. And for all those people out there who are contemplating suicide, since you kind of had a little personal hand experience in this, I think I'd like to give you the chance here to um, maybe give a little advice, if that makes sense, to all those people who are contemplating suicide and maybe let them know if you commit suicide, well, what's going to happen to you? I mean, there, there's always all sorts of theories about this that I've heard, like if you commit suicide, you're going to be stuck in limbo or something that's very similar to, to limbo, but at one of the recent uh, N5D conferences that I was at, there was um, some woman who was um, communicating with someone on the other side, I believe the guy's name was Eric, um, who committed suicide and Ever since he committed suicide, he's made a mission out of uh, informing people of their ailments and, and illnesses, and he's using and he uses the woman as a as a conduit. I mean, this guy. I don't know if that was his goal, his mission in doing that was kind of his punishment for committing suicide. That he's got to dedicate his afterlife to to helping people with their their illnesses. I mean, not really a big punishment as far as I'm concerned. I think that's a little bit of a a blessing to have that job in life because you're helping a lot of people. But uh, the idea that Someone who commits suicide is going to create some sort of bad karma for themselves simply because they committed suicide. Is there truth to that idea? Suicide equals bad karma? Or is, is it such a broad subject that you really can't give a definitive answer because it depends on the person, it depends on their life, it depends on their circumstances? Can you offer any information on this? Sure. Um, I'm told not to tell you that the answer to that. The Spirit told me that I'm not... There's part of it that I can't answer because I don't want to invite people to do it. I can tell you that we are not the judge. We do not. We are not allowed to judge what happens to people in the afterlife. It's a freedom. It's, you know, I can tell you that what I've been downloaded is spirits like Jeff, spirit or soul. And I really want to look back at that and, and ask my my uh, source, the answers to those questions later, but, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer's spirit, I can tell you, was destroyed. So when somebody is uh, just downright corrupted, um, their, their spirit's destroyed. It's not allowed to return. OK, um, as far as suicide, there's there's parts of it that the pe the people are just crying out. For someone to save them, for the for the spirit world to save them. And my advice is this. No one is going to save you. The spirit world will not save you. It's it's important to get up off your feet and realize that you are no different than anybody else. No one is greater spiritually than the other. The Pope is no, no greater spiritually than a homeless beggar on the street. We are all loved by source. And that if it means you just have to get up and take a walk, brush your teeth, look at a leaf, and just know that you are loved by the infinite source then that's the most important thing you need to do to get yourself out of that mess. When I say get yourself is ask this, ask the force to help you inspire you and move and move forward. It's there's a saying, feel the, feel the fear, do it anyway. You know, go when you, Winston Churchill said, when you're in hell, keep on going. And, you know, my personal experience was that my, I had shown my gift to a church and the church had told me it wasn't of God. And my wife, my soon to be ex-wife, um, sided with the church against me. And when I told her to leave that church, it started this verbal onslaught, like I'm the worst father in the world and there's no God in you. And, 
you're, you know, you're the worst. And I started believing the words that people said about me. People do not listen. If you're thinking about suicide, don't believe what other people are saying about you. I will tell you this. I don't believe that the emptiness and despair in your heart will ever be filled by another human being. You might get get parts of it filled when you fall in love. You might get parts of it filled when you're petting your dog. The only thing that can fill the emptiness in your heart and your soul is the unconditional divine love from the source. And find it fast. And you're not alone when you're when you're contemplating suicide. Understand that what's happening is that your fear driven ego ego by definition is the thing that tells you something you're not. And your fear is driving it. So what you're telling yourself is I'm the only I, w- I was telling myself I'm the only person that's ever been shunned by the church. The only person that's losing his wife, the only person that's losing his family And I'm the worst and I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And I started to believe what they said. And the truth is I am worthy. I'm a child of the great source, just like you, just like everybody else. And we're all here to do something great. I scanned a rifle of one of the soldiers that committed suicide. Uh, His name's uh, Shane Busby was his father and his name was Wal- uh, William Busby and he took his battle rifle out and I put my hand over it and I saw blue skies and he's in heaven he's in heaven um, I don't want to I'm not here to judge and tell people what happens when you commit suicide but I can tell you that that it's not a good idea If it happens to people in your family, do not judge them. You're not the judge. We're here to love and forgive. That's it. You know, that the 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 the, (laughs) I can tell you that I was suicidal. I lost my family. I lost my riches. Um, It does it. It doesn't mean anything. What what means everything is what am I here to do for source? These are all challenges. You know, one of, this is a, this comes to a great subject. One of my one of my clients said, "I'm when we're doing the karma cleansing, we we go through a list of anger of angers that last us more than 24 hours, resentments, right? And most of them, they say, I'm angry at God for creating evil." And I said, okay, well, what's your part in that? They said, well, their part in it is thinking I can tell God how to do his job or the spirit, right, the source. And then the next one is, you know, what's affected? Is it emotional insecurity, control, control, pride? And what happens when when you're angry at, at, at I'm just going to use the word God, when you're angry at God for creating evil, what happens to you emotionally? I get angry. I get depressed. I get anxious. Okay, let's remove that anxiety. Let's remove the depression. Let's remove the anger by saying, I'm not God, and I'm not here to tell him how to do his job, because the reason evil exists, and I can tell you right now, is that if there was no evil, if there was no darkness, we wouldn't need God. We wouldn't have to even look at him. We wouldn't even have to go there, and we'd probably create evil ourselves. The reason it exists is because it, it's a challenge for us to find spirit. It's like, man, I have two challenges. And, and when you say I'm angry at God, I remember like there was, you know, in using it in the Bible, Jesus was on the cross. Right. And he said when he took in all the sins of the world, whether you whether you believe in this story or not, I'm just going to use it as a reference. Um. The sound, if you took all the sins of the world and put it on a record player, it would say, why have you forsaken me? Why, God, why do you hate me? 
Why are you hurting me? That's what sin is. That's what karma is. You know, bad karma. You know, this is where this comes from. And basically, God's not angry. He's just presenting challenges to see if you'll come to him or to her. If you'll come to the spirit. Right. And, um, you know, suicide, I had that challenge with suicide, battles with alcoholism. Uh, you know, I was molested as a child. And let me tell you, I get this a lot from people, whether you were physically, sexually, mentally abused by your family or, you know, a baseball coach or whoever. Right. Um, this creates in people a deep seated rage a rage and i find you know like when we're first in college and high school and we're meeting lovers and oh i'm in love and that feeling inside me is filled but as the years go by i don't know about you know you andrew but i mean you start to go get in relationships and you start to see more of your your defects come out and other people's defects and lack of trust and anger and rage and trying to control your mate and they're trying to control you and we're just going about it all wrong. We get mad at the, we get mad at the systems. I hear all the time. I'm angry at the systems for controlling humanity. I can't control that. I'm not, I'm not God. I'm not the source. I can't wave my magic wand and change that. What I can do is change me. I can live in a relationship where I know I'm doing the right things and allowing my mate to be free. I know that I'm putting the right foods in my body, exercising, communicating with spirit. And I, and if I, and once I let everybody else go and tried not to control them, then I'm free. I'm free. And it's a, uh, you know, these are common revelations I have with clients. Now, the the issue, though, there is, is how can you be free, let people go when you're being attacked? I mean, I've had some people attacked up to upwards of twenty five hundred percent consumed spirit by negative forces and demons. So how can you function? You know, like someone I just worked on a child from Abu Dhabi and. The, the grandmother told me to do a remote clearing. She said, he's angry all the time, Greg. I don't know what to do. I said, no problem. I got this. Boom. We cleared him. Next morning, she emails me and says, uh, Vinny came out of his room and he said he's happy and he loves me. You know, we don't know what's going on in the spirit world. We have all we know is that we the spirit world controls the physical world. And I tell you. Andrew, 100%, we do get attacked. My mission is to go to battle for you. Okay, excuse the war terms, and you know I know some people don't like to hear that, but when you're when you're living in my shoes, and you get uh, stroke-like headaches and nausea and uh, get attacked the way I get when you go through a week of just dis of diminishing seven warlocks power over people, you know, removing all this sludge from people in their homes. It, it does feel a lot like a battle. However, the way of winning that battle is love, love over fear, forgiveness. You know, when I wake up in the morning, my, my, Come on, man. I've, I've worked with so many people. There's some days where I'm like, I just want to go to the beach and relax and I want to cancel all these appointments. And then something tugs me on the shirt and says, no, Greg, they need you. They need you. And that's that's what. I tell a lot of people is, you know, you're needed and then a lot. And then a lot of clients will say, but what's my purpose? And I said, look, not everybody's going to stand on top of a mountain like Gandalf and cast spells or like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Okay. But just going to your job and going in with love and not fear 
and showing compassion to people that are around you or sometimes just being quiet is a lot better than going into that job and saying, I hate being here. I can't stand it because what we're doing when we say that is I don't like it. I want it this way. I want it that way. And it's not the way I want it. Instead of I'm not in control, spirit is in control. And the truth is, I don't even know if one of my coworkers is suicidal and that if I actually treat him with love and respect, it might change his life. He's, that person might be looking for a friend. Oh, and by the way, if I work in the company and I put my heart and soul in it, it creates jobs. And one of those people's children that works in the company might have a child that will be a Gandalf on top of a mountaintop. And if this, com if this company doesn't succeed, that child might not have the education that he needs. And, you know, what is what is our missions on Earth? I mean, gosh, be the best cashier you can be. When people come in, shake their hand, hug them. I went to the grocery store. I tell this story a lot. There was a very heavy set woman. She looked at me and says, you have beautiful blue eyes. I said, honey, your heart is gold. I got to give you a hug. I gave her a big hug and it was the best. It felt so good, right? How do I know she wasn't suicidal in the morning? How do I know her husband didn't cheat on her that day? How do I know that she is, doesn't, wasn't diagnosed with cancer two days ago? And it's, it's, um, that's how we, we, that's how we do, do the work here for the spirit world on earth, you know? It's hard, too, because a lot of uh, people that get into this field, you know, you're, one reference in the Bible, once again, is that you're going to be set out like sheep among wolves. And there's there's setbacks. You know, I come from an interesting background where, you know, if I mention something biblical to the spiritual community, I'm going to be attacked. If I go to a church and I show them my dowsing rod, I'm going to be attacked. If I go to the military world that I used to work with and talk to them about spirituality, I'm going to be attacked. But I'm not going to focus on the few that attack. I'm going to focus on the masses who are enjoying this wonderful miracle. Does that make sense? A absolutely. I've um, heard about this before. And uh, one person that I've heard about all this stuff before uh, was Daniel Teague of Vegas Star, Vegas Star Healings. Had him as a guest on my show previously, as did uh, Michelle Walling. Um, and I uh, want to go through a list here of the type of healings that um, uh, Daniel Teague does. And why don't you tell me if this is what you do, or maybe if you do it differently, and if there's anything he does that you can do, that well, anything that he doesn't do that you can do, by all means, um, let me know. I don't want. I don't mean to create any sort of a um, battle or war between or a conflict between you and da Daniel Teague or anything. I just want to get a better sense of how these healings are done and, and how people do them. So going down the list of Daniel Teague's services here, he does parasite cord cutting, personal clearing, chakra balance and pain relief, chakra protection, chakra cords, pain cord cutting, home and workplace clearing, paranormal awakening healing, something dealing with the third eye there. Um, or possession clearing, paranormal entity clearing, obsession cord cutting, animal clearing on pets, advanced chakra balance, and integrated energy um, therapy for self-help. So do you do all that and then some, or are there some things there that you that he can do that you can't do? Um, no, I do I do all that and then some. And, so uh, what's the and then some? The, the and then some is uh, reprogramming and then also removing – teaching people how to remove the inner demon themselves. Okay. So when we do a karma session, I'm sparring with this demon and then they remove this demon themselves. And what it is, is the, um, key characteristics they have, which have been holding back not only them, but their whole family for generations. And if they don't teach their children this, then their family's not going to strive. That's one aspect. When I, It's been scientifically proven that when someone has a personal cleansing with me, that their chakra fields are balanced, their organs 
are, are harmonious, their energy fields are balanced. And this is all done when, when you remove negative spirits, demons, entities, all that's done. But then also your physical conditions are healed too. Like for instance, if I, if I, um, scan someone in a karmic, uh, trauma session, like I'll scan someone and 150% of their spirit is, um, you know, affected by karmic trauma. Also, I'll read that maybe they were drowned in a past life or hung. And then I tell them to remove that noose. And then all of a sudden their throat pain goes away or their um, pains that have been hurting them. One, oh, this is interesting. Like one lady, she was a horse in a past life, a workhorse. And and she was also affected by a hit, uh, eye implant that gives you self-negative talk, right? So she has to walk up four flights of stairs all the time. And she says her hips hurt her and this. And I said, because you're you were a workhorse and you're a workaholic and you know it. And you had to get a place that's four stories up, even though you're in your later years, because you want to work. You, you have this mentality. But when you're walking up the stairs, you're thinking of things you shouldn't. And so then you throw your hip out. And so there's, um, you know, reading that list. When I remove implants and uh, parasites, I do it all in one swoop. Um, and basically, I can tell you that between the scanning of negative spirits, demons, the um, karmic trauma, and then the uh, alien attacks, scanning for that, removing of the implants, which there's three majors that I really take care of, and then the rest are wiped out. It takes five minutes. And then the rest of what I do, and I'm not sure if my fellow teammate and colleague does that. We're teammates here. There is no competition. Um, we're brothers trying to help the world. Is that there's a huge reprogramming process. So people ask me, how do I keep the spirits from coming back? And so I explain to them how to do that. Then when they go through my karmic session, um, there's, uh, um, like I said, they they learn, they have this aha moment, like, aha, oh my gosh, I didn't realize my family does that. And this inner demon, literally, I see the hands released from the shoulders and then exit stage left. And it was them that did it, you know, and it's like, you did it, you did it. <laughs> and then... On the home cleansings, there's also aspects like Native American uh, curse. And I didn't hear that in the list. Um, you know, when you when you like a lot of times, if you have a house that's near a natural body of water, like a stream or a lake, t chances are there was Native Americans living there before. And, and this is also said in Europe. OK. Um, if you don't ask for permission to be on that property when you buy it. It's just going to be hell. So a lot of my clients, I say, well, I know there's Native American activity. I can tell there's negative vortexes. There's uh, portals to the dark side, maybe alien attack, negative spirits, demons, disembodied spirits. Um, but this Native American part, I can ask them if, if they will grant me permission. But you need to do this yourself. You need to go in front of the property with an offering and ask them permission and you literally will feel the energy part like the Red Sea and you'll be able to walk and take your property back. And uh, so there's that aspect to it. And I can explain it as like there's um, angelic healing, angelic realm as well as, re as, well as scientific, as well as count counseling and rebuild. Um and, and believe it or not, I actually start to learn more and more. And then as I'm healing people, I I will go, like, say, after every 10th person, I'll go back to everybody I ever healed and promote healing in them, you know. And it, does, it doesn't take a huge ceremony. It doesn't take a, uh, you know, me to take out all these, like, incense and, you know, dance around like a shaman. It's, it's actually quite easy. Well, easy for um, 
someone like you who's definitely got a lot of uh, experience in this um, in this field and knows what he's doing. A lot of people, though, would uh, – I hate to use the word jealous, but, you know, a lot of people are like, why can't I have the uh, ability to do this? Well, you got the ability. It's just a um, matter of expanding consciousness and and the other things you got to do to – to be able to do it, and maybe we'll get into that a little later, but I do have like a little list here of um, some things to go over, uh, specifically angels. When you talk about seeing angels, I'm going to guess you're not really talking about seeing in the five sense seeing, like uh, an Egyptian wisdom keeper who died recently named Hakim Iwan um, said we actually have 360 senses. I'm guessing that one of those other 355 senses are the kind that you're using to uh, see the um angels am i am i right on that one well i mean if you the only way i can describe it is you see them in your third eye you know they're there you can put bits and pieces in, of them together and then you get a vision of what they look like like when i'm talking to somebody and you know i mentioned hey there's this heavy set person next to you that has glasses and dark hair and they're telling me something to tell you and they're like oh my gosh it's my grandpa you know and, oh, yeah, and by the way, he's got a flannel shirt on, and he smells a little bit of B.O., you know, he's got onions in a headlock. Yeah, that's my grandpa. And um, so the seeing is, uh, it's it, you know, it's just being able to see into the spiritual world. And um, the angels, um, they're magnificent. Now, I mean, here's the, here's the cool part, and it's just to, like, blow some people's minds or whether you want. So people like, well, you know, there's the biblical angels, and then are they alien or this and that? And I'm like, well, if an angel actually came out of the sky the way I see them and flew into and flew across the sky, you would think that was an unidentified flying object. So what's the difference? You know, these are things coming from this realm, from other dimensions, other planets. You know. What is it? What is the difference between that and, and, you know, extraterrestrial? And the beautiful thing is there's this awareness now. So you can talk to people about this without them thinking you're crazy. They can they can think I'm weird all they want, because one of the definitions of weird is supernatural. But I do want to address that. And I know you want to talk about angels, but you said jealousy. There is no jealousy. It's. We're all here for a special purpose. And that's it. And no one is greater than the other. No one has greater powers than the other. I used to lay I used to lay on my grandmother's lap after school and watch Transformers and she used to pet my head. And it was the most healing thing in the world. Proper human touch. Letting people know that they're loved and that that, that you care about them. That's the greatest gift. You know? And uh I can tell you that there's no, <laughs> there should be no one jealous of anybody's power. It should just be that we all work together as a team and we don't judge. We just <laughs> stick together, you know? It's, ask me again that angel question because I don't feel like I answered that properly for you. No, I think you did. You talk about it's a, like a third eye thing in regards to how to see the angels. You said, um, well, I asked, um, do you, you, when you, you, when you use the word see, you use the word see as in the five senses and the sight, like the five sense reality we're uh, thinking about, or like I mentioned that indigenous wisdom keeper from Egypt who passed away recently, Hakim Iwan, who said we actually have 360 senses, not five. Um, so I'm thinking, uh, okay, well, what kind of, um, I don't know if you can easily give names to all the other 355 senses, because it's um, like way a um, more complicated than what a lot of people lost in the matrix would understand. But I, I'm thinking, okay, when you see the angels, you're using those other, some of those other 355 senses aside from the five mainstream ones. So I can you? Tell you, I, I, here's, this is, a, this is something that I hope you find interesting and don't judge me is that I, I have done absolutely no metaphysical research at all. I haven't studied from anyone. I don't know. I don't even know half the people's names you're mentioning. I didn't really understand. I didn't study what 5D or 3D or I didn't. I, I'm not. I've never researched on what the shift is. This has all been downloaded and it's just a pure form. And I keep it that way. And it's very powerful. And 
you know, I equated to like, you know, I, I'm a sculptor, right? And I, when I went into master's degree in sculpture, you know, New York Academy of Figurative Art, and these kids came from Russia and China, and they were amazing. I'm like, oh my god, they're so good. And like, I had to work hard to be a sculptor, but this thing was downloaded, and it's just natural. And and it it doesn't scare me. What scares me is people that don't understand it and that that um judge you know that's the scariest thing and uh the beautiful thing is that when i'm talking to my cl like clients or talking to other people is that i share them my stories man i'm not like i just got i've been on this interview with you and i've already told you i was suicidal and molested that takes courage that's how you when when you're when you're not afraid to talk about your stuff with a complete stranger and they open up, you're going to come to some knowledge, some understanding, some healing that you've never had before. And it's when we come together, you know, I learn more. Okay, so like someone might be jealous of what I can do of the healing part, but I guarantee you every one of my clients walks away from a session and they think, wow, I helped Greg too. Because I'm going through things just like they are. We're humans. We're spiritual beings trapped in a human suit, whatever you want to call it. But the point here is to be real. And then whatever does the clearing is the force. That's not me. That's just this power that's there. And I and I have the choice to either use it, be uh, loving, or be fearful and hide it. And when I see the angels, they open up their chests. And these blue lights come out of their chests and heal people. This blue light energy comes off their fingers. When they take negative spirits and demons away, they swoop down and they grab them and they bring them into black holes. A black mist evaporates off people's bodies. Spirit crows. So that was an interesting one, you know, to attack cancer. Come in and eat that away and take it out. When I attack uh alien torture devices they start to fall down around me like black shards of this like crazy volcanic rock and then they dissipate and they're sucked up into the atmosphere and and shoved into a black hole i, I keep using black hole because that's actually the recycle bin so to speak of of all this stuff and, um, you know, downloads like the Bermuda Triangle is the Bermuda Triangle because that's where souls and spirits, you know, enter and exit this plane. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, the shift, I, people say the shift, and I've done some little bit of research on it lately that, you know, we're all going to, some people are going to be beamed up and some are going to stay. And and then there's also just, it's a, it's a, a shift in understanding a shift in human power, spiritual power on earth. And the answer, Andrew, is all the above. Is that we don't know. The challenge, and once again, is to, um, you know, I sign those angels to people. I tell them, if you go into an interview, ask those angels to go in there and clear out the room. And then go in. And then when you're there, ask the spirit to guide your words. You'll get the job. Um, law, law of attraction is huge. I mean, that's when we were talking about the suicide thing, that's law of attraction right there is that the more despair I feel, the more despair I'm going to get. The more despair I feel, the more despair I'm going to get. Stop. I am worthy. I'm going to have everything I ever wanted, and I'm going to get it by serving humanity, and I'm going to get out of this mess. And the, and the universe is going to do that, and I believe it, and it will happen. You know, you have to understand people that are suicidal, people that are in despair, everybody, Andrew, just including you and me, what's the one thing we all want? We want to be loved. We want to be respected. We want people to understand our pain. And the problem is that we look for humanity to provide that, and humanity can't. I mean, it can at times, right? You know, like you call your dad and he gives you good advice and you're like, yeah, he was there. But our expectations of everybody else is so great. 
And when our expectations are so high and they're not giving me what I want, we get miserable. But then if we realize, hey, I don't need I don't need this. I don't need a human to make me feel this type of feeling. I don't have to have people, you know, worship worshiping me. I've got to have this strong connection to source. That's what's going to make me happy. That's that's then when that's when you will have the people come to you. <laughs> the people will come hug you. They'll feel that energy. And, um, you know, the angels, I can tell you to me, they look, you know, the non non gender Nordic, um, very Viking like with lots of glowing lights and huge wings. When I trace them out on the ground, the right wing is always like a foot longer than the other one. And that can be the dominant wing because I learned later that birds have that. Some birds have one wing longer than the other. Or it could be because of the when I trace them out, it's the rotational, you know, the way the earth is rotating and their energy vibes are just kind of flowing out that way and it extends. And, and it, Andrew, the truth is it doesn't matter. What matters is they exist. The spirit world exists. And if you need help, ask someone that can help you. Don't be afraid to reach out. Don't try to be God and take control of everything that's in your life. Surrender. Well, well, since you mentioned that, I, I got to ask you um, whether or not there is truth to the idea that um, if you ask your guardian angels and spirit guides for help too much, particularly if you're asking for help in cases where no additional help is really needed for you to get the job done, are you going to be creating bad karma for yourself simply because you're not sucking it up and doing it yourself when you should be able to do it yourself without asking angels and guides for help? Or is there no such thing as asking angels and guides for, for too much help? It's okay to do that. You're not going to create bad karma. It's there's They're there to serve us, and when you come to them – they love it. They love it when you go to them. However, you know, that, that just, I, and I apologize for going to the Bible again one more time, but it says, those who don't work, don't eat. And my ancestor, uh, Benjamin Franklin, he's my ninth great uncle, said, giving to the poor creates a lazier poor. It's, it's basically comes to the, you know, teach a man to fish, right? What it is, and then you got law of attraction, and the last word is action. So if you're not if you're not doing what the spirit world's telling you when you ask them for assistance, you will not reap the reward. You know, and you can have whatever you want on earth. We know that. We know it. You know, the only thing that keeps us from having it is fear. Fear of being successful, fear of it working out, fear of actually getting up and doing it. There was a, one of my clients was a guy who was a paraplegic and he's in a wheelchair and he hadn't gone outside. And he uh, he had he wanted to heal people. He wanted to be a healer. And I said, listen, let's all right. Time to talk to the inner child. Right. That little inner child of yours is standing there. He's still got legs and arms. and He wants to go outside and play. Are you going to let are you going to keep him inside here? No. All right, let's go outside. He went outside. First time outside in three years. Sometimes we just need, we need a little push. The name of love. The problem is, Andrew, isolation. To use a story about, uh, let's use the devil as an, ex as an explanation here. He was rejected from heaven to hell, right? And he was like, rejected, oh, rejection, that's terrible. I hate the way that, ooh, I like this. I'm going to make all those humans that God loves more than me feel rejected. And rejection is the first part of our destruction, spiritually, mentally, financially, the whole thing. And we feel rejected, and then we go into a place of fear-driven ego. Well, I'm not good enough, or I'm better than everybody else. I'm the only one suffering and I'm and I'm the only one doing this. And then when we get to that place, we isolate. Isolation. You know, screw everybody, excuse my friend. Everybody, 
I don't like anybody. I'm going, I don't trust anybody. I'm going into my little hole. And that's where the sin, the karmic stuff, everything piles up. And then we, we experience financial, spiritual, or, or physical death, right? The way to destroy that is to kill the ego. I'm going to say something that's shocking and, 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 it, you know, it may disturb you, may disturb listeners, but I don't believe in a higher self. I believe that I'm nothing and that I'm here to serve the spirit. And that when I free myself of defining who I am, which is the ego, the ego is trying to define what I'm not, right? Then by being nobody, just being this thing that helps people, in return, I receive the blessings without expectation and without it being going to a place that is then fed into that ego, which then tells me something I'm not, right? Um, it's like taking away the place where the enemy can control you. And where do we start is, wait, I'm not rejected. I'll never be accepted by humanity. I'm always accepted by the source. So if I stay, if I stay with my antenna straight up and I know that I'm accepted by this loving spirit, I'm going to emit these cool non-judgmental, no, you're not going to affect me. You're not going to affect me. I'm not going to have expectations of you. I'm not going to have expectations of you. I'm just going to do my thing. But when I need you, I'm, or when I need people, I'm going to ask and there's going to be teammates and I'm going to attract good people. It's, it's, um, you know, isolation of cutting yourself off from, from trusting humanity is one when you realize that you're, if you don't put your expectations of humanity so high, you'll actually start to have those relationships that you always wanted. I mean, how many clients have I had? I, I had a client um, a week ago, and I've had several of them, that hasn't had a, a, um, a man in her life in 20 years. 20 years, man. That's a long imprisonment. And she's like, well, I just don't trust men. I'm like, well, man, that's a terrible. Honey, you have to, in order to be successful, you have to trust. What is it you're doing wrong? Or what is it you're you're your ailment that is keeping these people from coming along. It's because I'm, I think I'm God. That one person hurt me. So that means everybody's going to hurt me. That's the ego talking. Oh, and I don't deserve love. That's the ego talking. Oh, and I'm, uh, you know, all men are evil. That's the ego talking, you know, <laughs> and, Kill the ego. Okay, wait, I'm nothing. Lord, what do you want me to do? Oh, by the way, oh, you've been telling me the whole time that there is somebody special coming my way. Can you show me that person? And all of a sudden now your eyes are open and you didn't realize you were walking past that person every day at the bagel shop. Because you were so caught up in fear and ego. And, um, you know, Paul. You know, when you ask me what type of healing I do, that's a little different than my colleague is I do a lot of this. You know, it's about five to 10 minutes of wizardry coupled with, you know, 15 minutes to an hour of rebuild, reconstruction. You know, I can, people can remove your implants. They can remove your negative spirits and then leave you hanging. Or they can give you an education, sharing their own testimony where you both heal and learn more, right? Um, Andrew, life is a, this is, this is, <laughs> this is something I love. It's like in the Bible, it says you're born again. Like you need to be born again. And there's always, I'm a born again Christian. And, and I, and I'm, and I read it and I'm like, it doesn't say how many times you have to be born again. This guy, this guy, Greg Mara, spirit sculptor needs to be born every day. I have to be reborn every morning. Sometimes I have to be reborn every 10 minutes. And kill the ego. Destroy the ego to pieces. Smash it to oblivion in order for the messages to arrive. When I start to get angry, when I start to get frustrated, 
when I start to get when when those generational characteristics bring out that emotion that's nasty, dirty, and ugly is when I took control of my life away from source. The definition of experience is when you take control back from source. So here's the example. I'm suicidal. I want my life to get better. I'm going to ask source to help me get there. I'm going to start doing things for it. But it's not happening fast enough. So I'm going to take control and I'm going to, you know, put my will into it. And then it doesn't work out. Or I want to rekindle things with my ex-wife or my soon-to-be ex-wife, right? Say that's the issue. And I, I ask the source for help. And then two minutes later, I call her and say, I want to move back in. This is ridiculous. Why can't we work it out? I just took my will back. From, I took, I told them and said, you can't do the job. I can do it better. It has to happen faster. Instead of letting go, let that person heal. Let, let the universe do its work and you focus on your work and let the truth be realized. Let the future unfold in a wonderful way. You know, it's a, uh, you know, so I'm sure you have some more questions. Yeah, before I ask you, though, um, since I know you have the ability to do everything Daniel Teague does and then some, I suppose maybe at some point in the not-too-distant future, I'll send you a list of all those uh, healings that he does as well as the prices he charges. And if you can beat his price, I'll ask you to uh, do it for me, and I'll pay you instead of him. He's already done a few of them on me, but uh, the ones he hasn't, I suppose, okay. I could I'll ask get- you. I'll give you a free healing right now. How about that? Uh, well, actually, no, not now, because the purpose of my show is to get information out. I made a resolution a long time ago that <laughs> if I had a healer or a reader on my show, I would never ask them to do it while I'm doing the show because that will okay. take away time to get information. So let's wait until after the show to to do that, please, So because I got to get the important information out first. I really appreciate you doing this, but now is the time for important information, not, not healings and clearings. Um, it's a shame, though, I can't get uh, people to call into the show live now, so – if I did, I'd love to be able to give them the chance to, to call you for that, but that's not possible, unfortunately, because I can't do live shows because of some other problems I'm not really going to get into. But, um, yeah, at the end of the show, we could do that. Um, however, I want to talk about destiny tuning for a moment, because de- you mentioned the law of attraction. It's been said destiny tuning is the um, is the key to making the law of attraction work uh work to the best of uh, the best it can do and like what exactly uh is destiny tuning well it i guess the best way to think about it is um excuse me is to uh like change the frequency of your body so that the in the energy that you are radiating out into consciousness will allow for will be of a good high quality a love-based quality to allow um the law of attraction to manifest to the best of its ability and certain ways to enhance destiny tuning are um, to listen to audios that contain subliminal sounds and messages in them. Like, uh, this is particularly true with uh, money. Like, if you um, grew up in a household where parents argued about money all the time, you're going to have bad subconscious thoughts about money. And no matter how high you, hard you try to use the law of attraction to, to attain wealth, you're not going to be able to do it as long as you have those subconscious blocks that were manifested in your in your childhood from like your parents arguing all the time about money and such. So there's ways to clear that, um, such as listening to uh, little uh, um, audios that contain subliminal messages that over the course of time, if you listen to them enough, they will remove the blocks to allow you to, in, to utilize destiny tuning to a better way to, to bring the, uh, the things to you. So um, aside from money um, and, and using subliminal subconscious um audios and sounds to to unblock the blocks what are some other ways that you can think of to enhance your destiny tuning so that you can tune your frequency to something better to utilize the law of consciousness better advice for destiny tuning you got some advice on it yeah well like for instance the my generational karmic cleansing if if someone is suffering okay a study was done that someone in the 1500s started a church and that 
hundreds and hundreds of years of that family all the way to now had produced like 25 school presidents, senators, congressmen, lawyers. But then there was a criminal that they tested at the same time and they traced his lineage and produced like, you know, 25 rapists, 30 murderers, you know, 150 thieves. And what I would do with most people that are where their um, law of attraction for money is not working is find out why and how their attitude and their character defects are actually keeping them from doing that. So, for instance, um, uh, a man I knew in England, uh, jealousy, jealousy and pride and control. So when we found these out as his defects, he realized, yeah, my dad was always really jealous of people that had money. And so was my grandpa. And so this anger at other people having money cursed them instead of saying, hey, those people are really successful for a reason. They must have, you know, I'm really happy for them. And, and, and what is really fueling it? is, okay, maybe emotional insecurity. I feel insecure emotionally because they have something I don't. And then it all comes down to control. Well, they have a lot of money, and I'm God, and I'm judging them that they're bad. The way to free yourself up for your, for your, uh, your manifestations to come real is to say, I'm nobody. Let the manifestations come. Let me do the work for it. Let me write down on that dollar bill a million dollars. Let me imagine. And then this really works is like imagine, you know, the sky handing you that money and you flipping through the bills and you're depositing it to the bank. And if you have that dream girl that you imagined, go ahead and buy her a T-shirt and buy her a toothbrush and talk to her in the car. She's sitting next to you telling you, honey, it's going to be OK. I'll be there soon. And you listen and and if you want to know the truth is it's almost like uh, one of my good friends says, and I need to take his advice a lot more, is that work is the work is like the most evil word in the world. It's play. And start to start to enjoy this process of manifestation. I mean, it works with parking spots. It works with all those things. And, you know. Allow it to come, but also act towards it. So if you're blocked and these things aren't happening to you, it could just be that you're attacked spiritually. So you need a spiritual cleansing, karma cleansing. Your characteristics from your family are keeping you from being rich. Or your home. Your home is actually attacked by negative vortexes and you don't want to leave. You, you feel sick and nauseous and you want to sit down all the time. I think those are things that help free up the ability to manifest and also understanding one thing that, you know, there is infinite, infinite abundance for us, but sometimes we don't realize that we already have it. You know, I mean, it's kind of like there's, I've seen some of the law of attraction videos and the guys had like, I pictured this house that I wanted. And, and then I realized I'm already in it. You know, <laughs> And uh, there's no, Andrew, there's no, there's no amount of money, sex, power, uh, anything like that that's ever going to really satisfy us. We'll never, ever really be satisfied by it. But I think when the manifestations happen, it's not so much the result of it. It's just knowing that it works and that we believe in the spirit world that's all powerful that's the reward. You know, like when you manifest the parking spot and it shows up, you're not, I'm not so much excited that I have the parking spot. I'm excited that, oh my gosh, it works. You know, it works. And um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I got to practice that manifesting parking spot a little more. I know Greg Prescott does that all the time when he's uh, going about to go to the beach and it always seems to work well well if he can do it i can do it anybody can do it so yeah i gotta practice that a little more no question um you'll do it andrew you'll do it yes i'm sure i will i've used law of attraction for some other things pretty well so uh 
All right, let's look at some of these other things that I have here on my little list here. Okay, um, do you agree or disagree with the with the statement? Um, this is on, somewhat tied into the law of attraction, and I'm getting this from a Zulu shaman Credo Mutwa, who uh, was well known for that interview he did with uh, David Icke when David Icke interviewed him back in the um, late '90s. But uh, Credo Mutwa said in some of his other interviews. You have no one to, my mother taught me, I think he said it was either his mother's grandmother, the best advice anyone gave, ever gave him, he says, was, you have no one to blame but yourself. And that's from a strictly law of attraction standpoint. Uh, no matter what bad thing anybody ever does to you, you got no one to blame but yourself for, uh, because you brought it upon you, you either, because you either didn't use the law of attraction properly, you goofed somewhere, or whatever. So, do you, oh, you have no one to blame but yourself, do you agree or disagree? All right, here's the tricky question. It's like, you have no one to blame but yourself. Well, yes. Okay, so I'm looking at the only problem I have in the mirror today. That's me, all right? And that's a fair statement to say, but it's also very judgmental because, so if, that, if you're going to say that, then tell me how to fix it, right? You don't, you're, I'm going to blame you because you don't know how to manifest. Well, this guy right here can help you find out why you can't manifest. Because it's not, sometimes it's not your fault. If you're being attacked by 1,200% negative spirits and demons, alien attacks, your home's being attacked, your family's being attacked, and you have generational karmic trauma and characteristics from the past how the heck are you going to manifest right yeah fair question there you know so it's not you know i'm not going to sit there and say like yeah it there might be some like okay they're poor babies man it's like they're sitting there and they're manifesting and like why isn't it working it's like this thing's going boing, you know out of their head and the springs are coming out and the gears are grinding and why isn't it working why isn't it they're doing everything right that they're supposed to do but there's one missing link and and we need to find out what that is you know well, what i do in that um you know especially in that karmic clearing session is it's almost like a csi you know profile you know that all these tv shows about profiling murderers or whatever but it's actually a profile of you spiritually what makes you spiritually fail? We can look at what makes you spiritually grow and do wonderful things, but the answer is, you know, that's always, you know, more love, more love. But let's find out what is that characteristic that's holding you down? Why is it I'm always poor? Why is my dad poor? Why is my grandpa poor? I'm going to manifest. It's not working. Well, let's look at it. Oh, you, uh, you're afraid of success because you're emotionally insecure and you think you can control every outcome. You're manifesting, and when things start to manifest and they don't go the way you want, you, you shut down. Or it's not happening fast enough. This all comes down to, you know, the ability to allow the manifestation to happen, but is there something else affecting us? And I can tell you 100% that there's people that if they don't get cleared, if they don't look at this karma, this, this generational karma, if they don't clear their homes, if they don't take that leap of faith, then success is going to be very difficult. It's going to be a lot harder. Um, if you're coming from a place of anger, bitterment, resentment, and you are successful, it will be fleeting and it won't last long because you'll wind up destroying it. You know, hey, man, you can give the keys to the Porsche to anybody. Right. But do you want that Porsche needs to come back in good shape or it's going to be destroyed and in an accident because that person got enraged. You know, sometimes the universe protects us and doesn't allow these manifestations to happen because we haven't done the inner work. Andrew, I am also needing to do the inner work. It's like it's we all need to do it. It's a constant ma uh, maintenance program. You know, 
And it's not, it doesn't have to be painful. You know, it doesn't have to be painful. No, it doesn't. No pain, no gain is obviously one of the silliest expressions ever made. It doesn't, yeah. Although I will say, though, that um, getting uh, taking a little pain here and there and learning to tolerate it is um, not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, uh, you can learn to suck it up and take the pain. That'll make you stronger over the course of time, but it doesn't have to be done like that. But anyhow, um, you mentioned earlier something about um, how some people might you use the phrase beamed up, get beamed up. Now, this is a, a very controversial issue because I've heard some people say the idea that ETs are going to show up in a UFO, beam you up, and take you to another planet where you can live a much more utopian-like life is, is, is kind of the most ridiculous wishful thinking ever. It doesn't really work like that, and the only beaming up that could actually happen is not of the body, but is of the soul, or at least some of the soul shards of your soul that may um, be taken and you'll have some sort of a, a walk-in soul. So your personality may change as a result of that. But the idea that you would actually get beamed up, your body, physical body will get beamed up and taken to another planet is something that um, people like uh, Brad Johnson, who channels a drone as say is not, it's not going to happen. And also Andrew Bartsis, uh, Akashic Records Eater, who is probably my number one used source of info on my show. People have asked him, what is the significance of the year 2017? Because everybody's talking about 2017 being one of the most critical years for um, humanity's awakening or something. And uh, he said, um, 2017, the most significant thing he could think of probably is um, it's the year hope dies. Now, that doesn't seem like a very sacred, neutral statement. Andrew Bartzis is always saying, I try to speak in a sacred, neutral way and say, this year is when hope dies. Doesn't really sound very sacred, neutral. But what he he meant by that is, it's the year where all those people since the end of the Mayan calendar in 2012, ever since then, people have said, we're going to be saved by consciousness, um, ascension, transformation, ETs coming to save us, and all sorts of uh, magical things of sorts are supposed to happen. and, And this is the year when you realize, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. You got to suck it up and do it yourself. I mean, it's, it's, there's ETs and angels out there that are here to help us, but they're not going to save you. There is no come and save me. All those people that say they are just want to be white horses. You, you got to kind of do it yourself. And this is the year when people are going to find that out. And it's funny he says that because I interviewed uh, Ray Kusalande, Shinichi contactee, who uh, said that this is, uh, in, in 2017, at some point, we will undergo some sort of a, like, a crystalline transformation, where, for all intents and purposes, he said that everything that Andromeda Council contactee Tolek said would happen in January 2014, but didn't happen, involving a 4D transformation into, a, like, crystalline bodies and you, and world and all that's going to happen in 2017 and i hear him say that on my when i had him on my show and i'm thinking oh no not this again we've been down this road before every time someone thinks this is going to happen it always ends in disappointment and disaster and it's interesting how ever since the year started reiku salonich he seems to have disappeared off the face of the earth he hasn't posted anything on facebook or youtube in a while and i even sent him a message saying uh you do realize that if the day january 1st 2018 comes around and this world still looks the same and we don't have crystalline bodies and all that you're going to have a lot of egg in your face and people are going to wonder, okay, what the hell happened here? Why didn't we uh, send like you said they did? Why did your contacts lie? And, well, sent that to him a couple months ago. He has not responded to that, and uh, he hasn't responded to any other messages that people post on his Facebook timeline. So this kind of leads me to think he's trying to keep a low profile uh, until something in this year manifests. And, uh, I mean, if he like goes into hiding when this year is over and he don't transform, then, well, he's got some issues. And, I mean, I, I don't doubt that he's a genuine ET contactee. Some other people have said he is because they've met some of the people he claims to co- have contacted. But the, this is another – This if it doesn't happen what he said would happen in 2017, it's just another nail in the coffin for um, all these things, these magical things people predict, and it'll show that Andrew Bartzis was right when he said this is the year that hope dies. So do you think Andrew Bartzis uh, knows what he's talking about when he says this is the year hope dies? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, I can tell you that I don't know. I'm not here to be the judge. I'm not here to tell people when, what, where, when. I can tell you that, yes, maybe. Clicking all the above is always the, is always the safest route. Like, um, 
But I will tell you this. What's the difference when when the when the dark side, the the devil's minions steals your spirit away from you? Your spirit to live, your spirit to be a loving person, your spirit to want to help, your spirit to want to meet a mate. What's happening there? Your spirit is being taken away to another place. When you are attacked by aliens, they don't t they don't care about gold. They don't care about any of that. They want to harness your human spirit to fuel their machines, to fuel their dark side. So is that not your spirit moving on? Your spirit being, you know, transcended in a dark place. Um, I believe that. You know, I'd like to think that there would be a day where, like, you know, all the good people would go up and all the bad people stay down. And it just seems really childish to me to want to define. OK, it seems not childish. It seems very. Corrupt. To define what the spirit's plan is. And I go back, I'll go back to the Bible one more time. Um, and I, I really, I really urge people not to judge me over that. It's just, I believe in a true source from that, but not one that's in a church, not none of that organized religion. It just makes me sick is that there's a saying, it says, he who comes to me as a child will enter the kingdom of heaven. And to me, that's the key to all of this is that. You know, we spend all of our lives trying to define what it is that that God and the great power does. And when you finally do get to either beamed up in light or die or whatever, and you see the source and you start going, you know, I knew this and this is what I knew. And that's what I knew. And I'm going to tell you, I knew this was going to happen. And I knew you had that. They're going to be like, next. But if you're if you walk in and you're like. Oh my gosh, how wonderful is this place? Would you please, would you take my hand and sh let me s look around like a child would do? And you're gonna, you're gonna be in the best place you've ever been. You'll be, you'll be entering this wonderful world. I can tell you that the gentleman who, who stuck his neck out and said, we're all gonna have crystalline bodies at that time. Now, if we only see 2% of the light spectrum, maybe there's something what he's saying is true, that at that time we will have them. We just can't see it. You know, so what I do is I just I'm not here to make enemies. You know, enemies find me because when you have the authority over negative spirits and demons, you are sent out like sheep among wolves. And there's always people that want to uh, take you down. But. You know, like, let's look at that guy for a second and say, OK, let's not judge him and say, you know, what he did was pretty courageous. What it, what he was doing out of it. I mean, what, what his motive was, I don't know. And if I found out the motive, then I might be able to determine whether what he said was true or not. But the reality is that now it's an opportunity, you know, say it doesn't happen and he gets sick. And he gets suicidal. It's, now it's our opportunity to reach out to him and say, hey, man, it's OK. It's OK, bro. Uh, you know, I, I predicted a lot of things in my life that didn't happen. And I felt really bad about it, too. You know, and and uh, I mean, that's the real challenge. It's. um, You know, when I when I when people start defining what it is, the spirit world's going to do next. I like to kind of just play Einstein's attitude of like going like 23 levels above and looking down at everybody and going, all right, uh, what's really going on here? And it's everybody's everybody's trying their attempts to um, predict the spirit world in the guise that they are actually helping people. But the truth is they just want to be heard, loved and understood, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, I apologize if I keep it really simple, you know, it's just, uh, I've been through a lot in my life and I, I'm here to do great things, you know, 
I'm, uh, I'm, I've been chosen. I've been chosen. And I will not falter from this code of teamwork, love, compassion. I, uh, you know, that idea of the white horses and all that, whether it's now, whether it's down the road, whether it's, whether it's happening inside us every day, you know, it doesn't matter. What matters is what are we doing now to prepare for whatever is going to happen? You know, I can ask, I, I can actually go to the spirit and ask them, is that what's going to happen? But it's not important. People ask me all the time, can you tell me when I'm going to die? I'm like, no, hell no, I ain't going there. Can I ask them what what date this light people are going to evaporate and go up to the sky is going to happen? Yeah, hell yeah, I can. I'm not going there. That's probably why they gave me the gift, because they knew I wouldn't abuse it. You know? Well, that makes perfect sense. They gave you the gift because they knew you wouldn't abuse it. And on the flip side, uh, the the tyrants and government and the Illuminati are not going to hire minions who they know would uh, not stand for their evil deeds. They're going to hire people that go along to get along. Well, likewise, the good angels and such are going to recruit people that are going to go along with the good guys and stay going along with the good guys and not betray anybody, not pull a Benedict Arnold on, on the good people. But, uh, Illuminati, you, I mean, you brought up a great point. It's like, it's like Illuminati control the mind control, people control the whole thing. Right. It's like, I'll give you an example. I'm a, you know, I'm a fairly strong person. I played college football. I benched 410 pounds on my 40th birthday for three reps. And if you know anything about bench pressing, it's a lot of weight. I've, every time I've ever been encountered to be in a fist fight, I didn't fight back. I did not punch back. I just took the blows sometimes laughing, sometimes smiling. And as a young child, I always was like embarrassed. I felt like a coward, you know? And then I realized later on in life, Greg, you're not here for any other reason than you're being watched. You might, you might have thought that you were a coward, but you were being blessed in the heavens for doing that. And the Illuminati, it's like they're trying to control the world. And if I harbor anger and resentment, which is like any anger that lasts more than 24 hours, I'm letting that Illuminati control me and what I'm doing. If I get angry at the Illuminati, I'm actually letting them control me. That's what they want. That's why they have that, what is it, the 440 megahertz and all like the mind control panic, you know, frequencies. They want you to be pissed off. <laughs> well, hold on just a minute there. Um, there are those that um, even I would assert, like like Alex Jones would also assert that, uh, yeah, if you are mad at them and you obsess about them, you give them your power and you give them power. But that is not true if your specific intention is is to expose them and get mad at them for the sake of stopping their agenda. If your uh, intent is to stop their agenda, you can get mad at them all you want. You can talk about them publicly all you want. You're not going to give them your power because your intent, your intent is counter to giving them power. You're getting mad at them with love. <laughs> and it, I get it, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's no different than when I'm clearing a demon. I mean, this is a, it's not violent, but it's not pretty. And they're being sent away with love, right? And um, I guess what I'm saying is like when like you have a specific mission that's to create awareness, you're helping. You know, you're actually loving people and, you know, holding them accountable. And there's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of my clients, they'll sit there and they'll go, you know, I'm driving to work and I'm just angry at the Illuminati and why they're doing this and that. And I said, look, hey, whoa, stop. Listen, you can't control them. You can't control what they do at the moment. What you can do is control what you're doing. And so if you, if, if you, uh, you know, living that life of, you know, harmony and peace and understanding that non-judgment and all that good stuff, 
um, then you're not going to be a slave, you know? Hey, man, we can't be broken, right? You're not going to break me, guys. You're not, <laughs> Illuminati, you're not going to break me from loving and being free. All right? Yeah, right. But um, one little um, issue about that is people, I mean, a lot of people would assert, yeah, your rights are inherent and unalienable and all that. But the problem is our, the matrix that we are still forced to live in in many ways uh, has been set up in such a way that it's almost impossible to to exercise rights without being hassled. I mean, one of the best examples I can give is um, like the whole lie that driving is a privilege, not a right. Well, that's only true if the driver in question is a commercial driver. If you're not using the roads for commerce, then it's a right where you don't need a license plate, insurance, license, or registration. Problem is if you try going out on the roads in a car that has no license plate on it, there's a very good chance you're going to get pulled over a hundred zillion times by cops who either don't give a rat's ass about the law or are ignorant of the law because they've been trained to be ignorant of the law. Um, that's just one example, but it's a good, but it proves the point how you can't um, uh, exercise rights easily without um, getting hassled for it. Oh my take, God. Yeah, so is why, why is that? Well, what is the, if I were, if I were asking you and you were forced to give an answer to the question, what causes that this matrix reality to be like that where you can't exercise many of your rights easily without getting hassled for it by the system of domination control could, could you give a good answer as to why it's been how and how it's been set up like that what causes that we allowed it to happen we allowed it to happen we're we're like we're to blame it's weird it's i mean i hate to say it but we actually allowed it to happen i mean one of the greatest stories was in um World War One. I. I don't know if you remember, but the soldiers, there was like 4.1 million veterans in World War One, and they all served, and they didn't get their pensions. They took up arms against the White House. They literally grabbed rifles and like started going, you know? <clears throat> and today, we just kind of like let it happen. You know, I mean, think about the Revolutionary War creating the United States, right? I mean, it was like farmers that defeated the greatest empire. Like, it should have never happened, but there was something spiritually maybe behind it. And all those men who wrote, you know, were in the Constitution, and, and they were like, they wound up being poor and murdered, and, you know, just they they didn't enjoy what we think they enjoyed, you know, and, and uh, what they were supposed to be destined to. So we actually allow it, is kind of what I'm saying, is, you know, if we really – collectively as humans could get together and say, we don't like this. We don't want it this way. Then we need to do something about it, but we don't want to. Yes, because of apathy and laziness, especially, but um, moving on, just, you know, we got just a little over 20 minutes to go. Um, a couple of things I want to talk about. I do want to talk about your sculptor work specifically, but before we do that, um, one more thing about this issue of whether or not it's, um, good or are unhealthy to obsess about the bad guys for the sake of exposing and putting a stop to their agenda. This That reminds me of recently how Talek, the Andromeda Council of Contact, he uploaded a, a video to his YouTube channel where it was a, an apology. I think it was a completely unnecessary apology, and I'll get into why in a moment, but what happened was he recently held a conference in the Tucson, Arizona area this past October. It was supposed to be a love-based conference of spiritual metaphysical folks and also stuff involving ETs, specifically benevolent ETs with maybe a little bit of bad ET stuff mixed in there just as part of the information. But there was one speaker who he didn't say it was who, but I'm going to guess like I'm 99.999% sure he was referring to Stuart Swerdlow when he said this, but he said one of the um, speakers at the conference, um, the word on the street from some people that I was told, uh, Stuart Swerdlow caused really, really bad vibes at the conference with some of the things he was talking about, like about a potential staged alien invasion and depopulation as part of the agenda and, and other things that made people feel uncomfortable. So what did Tulloch do? He issued an apology for that. Well, Frankly, I think that was totally unnecessary. I think the only people that should be apologizing are the people that got uncomfortable listening to Stuart Swordlow because they, as far as I'm concerned, lack the discipline to be able to put up with what Stuart Swordlow was talking about. And I feel that is a big hindrance 
to your um, awakening and ascension, the inability for a lot of spiritual people to put up listening to negative stuff. Now, you would not, many wouldn't expect spiritual people to, to get uncomfortable listening to this stuff because a lot of these spiritual people, they uh, listen to conspiratorial <coughs> stuff and, and stuff about tyranny and the world and all as part of the original thing that, that helped wake them up, which eventually led to, they moved past that and moved on to stuff involving ETs, UFOs, and eventually metaphys metaphysics and spiritual stuff, you would expect, okay, because it played a role in their awakening back in the day, they wouldn't get uncomfortable hearing it. But that's not the case. Just like a sheeple who is totally asleep and doesn't know what's going on in the real world gets uncomfortable hearing things like, here's the evidence that shows 9-11 was an inside job. Well, they're going to get uncomfortable hearing that. Well, likewise, you say the same kind of stuff to someone who's spiritually awakened. They're, I mean, they're not like sheeple in the sense that they're awake, but they're still at the opposite end of the spectrum, if you will, because they're going to get uncomfortable, just like the sheep will hearing this stuff. So, like I said, I think there's no reason for Tolik to apologize. Those people should be apologizing for getting uncomfortable and not being able to put up with it. And I actually sent Tolik a, a message saying, why don't you invite people like Stuart Swerdlow at every conference? And if people say, I don't want to listen to this stuff, it makes me uncomfortable, you should get in their face and say, well, you're going to learn to like to listen to it. You better learn to like to listen to it, because if you don't, it's going to be a hindrance to your, to your awakening and everybody else's awakening. So I tried to do a little research on this. Why do spiritual people get uncomfortable easily? And the answer is basically the same answer as to why sheep will get uncomfortable easily because it violates their comfort zone. <laughs> okay, so with that being said, Hello, do you have any uh, advice on how to make sure that spiritual people stop getting uncomfortable listening to that uncomfortable stuff? I got condemned for using the word Jesus. I got condemned for um, using military words like attack. I got condemned for wearing dark shirts instead of wearing lighter shirts. And it was advice from people that are in the spiritual world that said, Greg, you know, you need to wear lighter shirts and you need to not talk, ever talk about Jesus. And you never, you should never use military words. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? I'm on the front lines. There is, whether, whether there's going to be uh what this gentleman said, attacks there, whatever, they're happening every day. Those attacks are happening every day. Now, if I use the word Jesus, it's because I take a lot from the Bible. I happen to, to harness a lot of energy from the Jesus spirit, whatever people of Jesus consciousness or Christ consciousness. But I don't shut off from all the other spirit worlds. I don't shut off from all the other deities. Who are we to judge? Once again, it's, they're not sheeple, they're the wolves. And us chosen ones are, are the sheep being thrown out into the weeples, the wolves, the, the, whatever the hell you want to call them. Don't apologize. If that's the message that you have, let it, let it, let it be. And, you know, if you apologize because you're afraid of suffering financially, then you're in the wrong game. You know, this it, this is about, you know, I'll give you an example. I was uh, condemned for making those state, you know, actually using that word Jesus and not military terms. And also I was condemned because I, I believe that the divine feminine, uh, the, one of the greatest powers in the divine feminine is nurturing love and compassion. And this person I was talking with, who's very powerful in the spirit world, said, that's so chauvinistic. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, to me, one of the most powerful women in the world is Sophia Loren. She's like, you know, a successful actress and obviously a successful but businesswoman. And she looks, she's very attractive. And she also, like, I also want to curl up in fetal position and suck my thumb on her lap. because she's that powerful. And I explained how the true relationship between man and woman should be a fearless love, you know, and that it's, it's a, I have a philosophy and it works really well to heal marriages. And it's, um, you know, the man does the courting and 
believe it or not, like when a when a woman uh, gives fearless love to a man, like says, "You look like Brad Pitt. You're amazing. You can do anything. This man's gonna do anything for you." And sometimes the women need that, but most of the time they're already really strong. They already have these chromosomes that we get jealous about. They're like they're they're already got their stuff together. And um, you know, I get attacked for like. We wanted you, like, they're saying to this guy, we want you to come to the conference, but you didn't tell us what we wanted to tell you. Or you're going to be courageously fearless in your message and don't waver because the spirit world's watching you. And when you do apologize, they're like, oh, boy, maybe this isn't the right person. You know, those those I was removed from some sites because of my faith which is actually all of the above. And I will wear dark shirts if I want to. I will use battle terms because I'm on the front lines. I get sick sometimes after healing all these. Listen, man, I healed. It was 350 people in two months. That's like unheard of. People usually do like Eric Rains, a buddy of mine. He does like three people a day. I'm doing 10 to 9 to 10 from 15 minute to hour sessions and I'm exhausted and I just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it because I am in the battle zone. I'm going to battle for you. What am I going to say? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I can only see you next month. No, that person needs me now. If they didn't email me now, they they need me now. My advice to that gentleman is you know, check out why you're doing this. Are you doing it because you're being led by the spirit? And you know what? Hey, he apologized. Well, guess what? Maybe next time he won't. But if, if you, my honest opinion is, yeah, there is there. There could be a lot of population control going on. There's population control going on right now because. Every veteran, 22 veterans that served in Iraq and Afghanistan are committing suicide a day. And they had inoculations that they think might be doing that. They might have picked up dark spirits from over there that are making them doing that. Maybe we're not showing them the love and understanding of like, hey, okay, we understand. They had to go and they went in the military and, and we're cutting them off. Or we're enabling them because we're giving them everything and treating them like they're victims. You know, po population control is not just the Illuminati, it's us. Population control. You know, when I don't think this world is overcrowded, but um, then again, I don't know. I mean, I've heard debates on that. It's not I mean, overcrowded, like, man. It's not overcrowded. Well, there's, there's okay. so much land. Well, yeah, they, they say the whole population world could easily fit in this um, state of Texas with room to spare, but. If you ever listen to the work of uh, Billy Meyer, the Pleiadian ET contactee, he said his uh, ET contacts have uh, warned of overpopulation. And I'm thinking, well, what's their criteria for overpopulation? I mean, when he says the world is overpopulated, everybody's like, oh, my God, this is a bad thing. we got to do something about it. But when the Illuminati says the world is overpopulated, um, people are like, oh, don't listen to that. It's just Illuminati brainwashing. Don't, don't believe it. It's just a lie. Well, if it's just a lie, then why is Billy Meyer saying it? And he's a good guy who works with good aliens. See why the where the confusion comes from there? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> I think the the... the the attack on the human race is multifaceted from many, many dimensions, many levels, many groups, and sometimes within ourselves. Oh, yeah, no question. It, it definitely like goes back to what I said earlier about you have no one to, to blame but yourself. But um, all right, we got we, we covered enough for that. Um, just a little over 10 minutes to go. It's a 750. Let's go until maybe 803 just to be started at uh at um, 6.03. Uh, I want to get into your sculpting stuff in a, for a moment, but before I do that, looking at your photos here, interesting, inauspicious photo here, uh, with you wearing chain mail in like a Knights Templar outfit with a, uh, with like a, uh, a Red Cross uh, logo on. Um, 
the Red Cross is a notorious uh, Illuminati front group. I say notorious, well, I don't know if that's the right word. Depends on what faction of the Red Cross you're talking about. A lot of good people in that in the, in the Red Cross think they're doing good for humanity, but when the Red Cross goes into a country, the they, while they're doing good for everybody that's in trouble, the bad guys who run the Red Cross as a wizard behind the curtain are using that as an opportunity to further the agenda. And I do remember... Um, some recent earthquakes and, and tsunamis and such that happened around the world, many of the people in the countries that were damaged were actually putting out messages saying, don't donate to the Red Cross. It's a scam. It's a front group. A lot of the money you donate to the Red Cross doesn't actually go to uh, to, to the people who need help. So to see you wear this uh, kind of uh, this outfit here with chain mail and a Red Cross on, it seems a little inauspicious. But I'm going to guess this was, uh, was this like a Renaissance fair or something that you were at? Or what's that all about? I'm actually a direct descendant of 23 Viking kings from uh, Sweden, and when they emig- when they emigrated into Normandy and were Christianized, my first ancestor, who was one of 12 knights in England, was a Hospitaller knight. And the the tunic that was made that was made by my ex-wife, but if you notice, I'm wearing a cloak that has a black cloak with a white cross. That was of the Hospitaller knight sect. And we get the word hospital from it. And they were pretty much combat medics. And so whatever it is my ancestor was doing when he died in in 1184 in Palestine is the same thing I'm doing now. Is I'm healing all the spiritual warriors for for the battle against darkness and light. Well... Go to keep up the good work. And uh, this thing you're saying about direct descendant of, uh, you mentioned Ben Franklin earlier about he's like a distant I, uncle yep. of yours. Yeah, and um, now you're talking about Viking descendants. This, like, I've read in a book somewhere that um, if you ever see someone uh, bragging in, like, the local mall that they're, like, a direct descendant of William the Conqueror, you should go up to them and say, well, guess what? So am I. Well, how can you be as well? Well, according to the guy in the book, we're all related in some way, and he made that uh, that uh, claim based on the idea that if you were to... Um, like count the number of people responsible for you well you got two your your parents then you count up their parents and then their parents parents and if you keep going down the line to like a certain certain year you will eventually get to a number that was much greater than the amount of people that ever lived and he's like well what's wrong with our math here and he said well the truth is your line is not pure you wouldn't actually be on this planet if there wasn't a lot of incest going on but it's not <laughs> like like the incest of a really really disgusting nature of like uh uh like a mother uh, uh fucking her son it's not like that no it's um incest of uh much more um i don't know if i like maybe the dis- word discreet is the kind he used but and also you got a lot of presidents presidential candidates related i mean george bush and john Kerry, ninth cousins twice removed and uh hillary clinton and donald trump 19th cousins now someone who hears that would say well 19th cousin that's such a distant relationship it's of no significance or is it i mean when you're talking about illuminati selecting people by bloodline you have to think maybe this relation is a lot closer this 19th cousin relationship than like a lot of people would downplay it and make it seem like it's not a big deal so when you say you're a direct descendant what exactly does that mean and are you saying maybe i would be wrong if i said well so am i i'm a direct descendant do because we're all related well no you're, you're talking something different here i think it's more that you from your past lives and from your actual like bloodline that you can learn lessons from these people to help you on your quest now it's like a it's it's a uh, a gift given to you to figure out the the riddles of who you need to be now in order to move on to be the the spirit that you need to be in order to reincarnate into an angel and then go back to source. So give you an example. One of those Viking kings died in a barrel of ale. Well, I can't drink alcohol. Another thing is, uh, you know, two of the brothers, um, Auric and, and um, Aldens, I forget the other guy's name, they found them in a forest uh, uh, beaten to death, and all there was was bridles. And, you know, I have just like many humans, uh, sometimes a deep seated inner rage that, you know, needs to be checked. And my brother and I don't get along real well. I remember times when we were like foaming at the mouth at each other, you know, and it's just that, you know, 
you can learn from that story just as much as I can. You know, and it doesn't I don't say this stuff like that. This makes me special. Come on, man. What did I tell you? Like when we first started the interview, I'm nothing. I've been in Time magazine for sculpting heroes. I've been on TV like crazy. I've I should feel a hell of a lot better about myself. Um, uh, but I just refuse to do that because I know that the secret is if I really, really, really want to like hear the messages from the spirit world, do what I'm here to do on earth is to be nothingness and learn from my past lives, my family, you know, well, thank you for clarifying that. Um, hope that helps people make more sense of the whole related uh, directly or indirectly kind of thing. But um, all right, we got about five minutes left. I want to read this thing you have here at the top of your um, Facebook page. It says, Gregory William Mara, master sculptor, is dedicating his life towards the pursuit of classical historical um, statuary to honor the United States of America and promote her greatness worldwide. Okay, um, a lot of people would want to vomit reading that. The, honor the United States of America and promote her greatness worldwide. Um, okay, you do realize the only thing the United States of America is good for is being the Roman Empire of the modern era. So why would you want to uh, promote her greatness worldwide when the only thing it's good for is leading the list of nations of the world in a number of times we've invaded other countries? And if you believe it's for, to fight for freedom, I got some really nice oceanfront property off the coast of Afghanistan that I'll sell you for five bucks. It's not. It, it's to further the Illuminati empire. The uh, United States of America is what the Roman Empire was, which was what the um, uh, Babylonian Brotherhood Empire was, uh, like around Sumerian times. So, why, can you please clarify for those that would want to vomit reading this statement, why would you want to build sculpture to honor the USA and promote her greatness, whatever you mean by greatness, worldwide? Well, there's I can explain that in several different ways. I do believe that that this country was started with the greatest of intentions, and I do believe that the focus on my sculptures were honoring those who actually, you know, whether war, war, I hate war, I'm a pacifist, but I have a lot of compassion for soldiers that go out there and have to fight. And I have compassion for everybody. And I can tell you that I lived in Europe for uh, many years and I didn't feel as free as I did when I was in the United States because I, you know, when I was in Austria, I couldn't get a commission because I wasn't an Austrian. And when I was in Slovakia, I couldn't get a commission because I wasn't a Slovakian. But in the United States, anyone can get a statue commission and be successful. And, um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of negative aspects to this country and there's a lot of ne negative aspects to a lot of countries, but I, I guess I'm just a lot more of an optimist and a hope and, a, and hoping that, that people understand that they're that this country is a blessing in a lot of ways. It's just been corrupted. You know, I, uh, I can tell you that I've been visited by George Washington's spirit several times and he's, he's in tears. He's in tears. He told me, he said, I want you to honor my children, you know, sons and daughters, that uh, suffered from the people that sent him out to war. You know, politicians lose wars, but the soldiers are the ones that suffer. And um, I just have a lot of real, I have a lot of empathy for them. That's all. Um, although I don't agree with war. The greatness of this country, do you believe this country can be great? Absolutely. I mean, it goes without saying the, the founding fathers, they definitely had good intentions. I mean, some people would say that the American Revolution was a farce and a fraud. It was just a plot by the Illuminati to uh, convert America from a prison with bars into a nation that felt like a prison without bars to give the illusion of freedom when, in fact, they're, they're not free. And the founding fathers were front men in that. Well, no, the founding fathers were not front men. They were innocent pawns. And all the bad things that Freemasons have done since then 
was caused by infiltration by bad groups such as the uh, Adam Weishaupt led Bavarian Illuminati and of course George Washington left a note read wrote a note saying my fellow Freemasons I'm afraid we're infiltrated and I'm afraid everything the good things that we stood for when we founded this country are going to be in jeopardy and in the course of time people may view the Constitution as like more than a goddamn piece of paper well yeah you he was right. Well, he didn't say that. I got that from a political cartoon where Benjamin Franklin yeah. is holding the Constitution saying, my biggest fear, gentlemen, in the course of time, people will view this document as nothing more than a goddamn piece of paper. So the founding fathers, yeah, they would be in tears because they were completely oblivious to the fact that all the good things that they stood for um, were uh, going to be taken away over the course of time. Although you mentioned earlier that the American Revolution, it was like all the like the three percent, they say, like the like the farmers standing up and beating the greatest empire in the world. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, do, I, I think it, it's kind of like it seems kind of absurd on the face of it when you realize the sun never set on the British Empire. Uh, the, the only way that like 13 ragtag colonies with only a few percent of its population would have actually stood a chance against the empire that the sun never set on on a global scale was if the war was manipulated to have them win and that does tie in many would assert to what i said earlier about how the american revolution was to turn america from a prison with bars into a a prison without bars but don't tell that to the founding fathers they well you can tell them that but they would say well we understand that that's what it was but i can tell you we never never would have wanted that to happen when we were fighting for all the good things we stood for and um if you truly are a direct descendant of ben franklin like you say well that's something to be very i think proud of i mean say what you want about how ben franklin may have uh had a few e illuminati connections and all that and how he was uh in a sense the henry kissinger of his day he was a very fascinating guy never missed a lodge meeting and was indeed a diehard patriot and i encourage people to listen to my interview with uh, Fritz Springmeier where he says all sorts of good things about Ben Franklin and why he really amazed him and all that love him, hate him stuff that people say because Ben Franklin had Illuminati connections. Well, no, I think uh, in a sense that's beside the point because even though he may have had connections, he was in many ways an innocent pawn like the the rest of the founding fathers. So uh, It's funny, it's 60, was a 60 percent of all the officers that, officers that served in the revolution were actually Freemasons. Yeah, and if you will look at uh, when you learn about the American Revolution in like elementary school, high school, or college, and you look at the textbooks, nowhere in the textbooks is the word Freemason mentioned. That's obviously, a, in hindsight, it's a, it's a huge oversight, but you can kind of understand why they would leave that out of there because they really don't want to get into the real deep secrets about what the American Revolution and many other wars, for that matter, were we're really all about like French Revolution with Jacobins and all that. But um, all right, I'm digressing. And with that being said, we've been on for two hours. Um, I'll make sure I upload this to YouTube and spread it far and wide. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to hang up on you now. And then uh, you said you'll give me a clearing. Uh, can I? Do you need me to call you back in a minute to do this? Because I'll call you back in a minute. I just want to check the recording and um, of, the, of the show and all that and put it in the right file. But do you need me to call you back to do the clearing, or can I just sit here and do my work and you'll be able to do it on me without uh, without me having to speak to you over the phone? I can do it remotely and email it to you if you want. And the other thing is, there's a way to is there a way to mention the website to get? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, you, get 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 your get your info out. Yeah, by all means, get your contact info out and everything. So it's a, a www. Mara. That's M A R R A Spirit Sculptor. dot com. And that's that's the best place to book a session. All right. Okay, and you do have a Facebook page, but it's probably better to use the website. So, okay, so I can hang up on you now, and you'll be able to do the healing on me, and you'll email it to me when you're done. Everything's cool. I don't need to call you back. No, you're cool. Enjoy oh. the rest of the day. All right, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Namaste. Take care, and good luck. Bye bye. All right. Namaste.